as I said earlier, we're so privileged today to have uh, someone I truly, really, really respect, respect, and that's Mr. Troy Barnum come speak with us. Uh, if you haven't met him, I'm sure that uh, you'll get to know him just by what he has to say here this morning. He's going to tell a story, uh, well, it's not, not just a, it's a true story of what took place two years ago now? Yep, two years. Two years ago. So, and let's make welcome Troy Barnum. Can y'all hear me okay? Yep. We on? All right. Uh, let me invite you to John, the 12th chapter. Book of John, I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. Would you follow the translation you have on top of it? You'll be able to do that. Just a few words as you, we head to the scriptures this morning. Uh, uh, and, and likewise, uh, Brother James, uh, my affections for you. Uh, appreciate you. I couldn't be in a better place to preach this morning, particularly the story I have to tell. Uh, I've been telling people, and I've got some folks being my publicity people, uh, volunteering to do that, to tell you uh, that I don't have anything contagious. Uh, I know I'm wearing that mask. Uh, it's not a political statement, uh, but it's just the fact I waited four months for an ablation, and it happens tomorrow. And uh, so it's really as much for my family's benefit to do what I can to keep them from crawling the walls uh, that I'm doing what I can to make sure I have that appointment. Probably should have had it sooner, but it's just the state of, of, of our uh, communities right now in terms of uh, there's a shortage of healthcare workers and there's a bit of COVID and flu going around. I uh, dodged one bullet already this week. My two-year-old grandson, uh, and you want to see a picture of him? He's right here. <laughs> and so my two-year-old grandson um, got COVID this week. And usually I'm around him a lot. He's only two miles from me. And just been blessed that for those days ahead of that, I wasn't around him. And the one time I was close, uh, I was smart enough to to leave because my daughter also was, was showing symptoms. So pray for them, but uh, they're doing better. And uh, uh, the kids are so resilient. Uh, he took a dose of medicine and told his mom he was all better now. Uh, and so, uh, and, and he was just running laps around the house uh, day after he was diagnosed. So you just uh, uh, thank you for your prayers for our, our ministry. But I can't be in a better place today than here being beside the king of ablations right here. Uh, your pastor has uh, shown remarkable improvements since his ablation, so that's great encouragement uh, to me. And uh, I've been in the hospital four times since the hurricane, and all for part. This be, this be number four this week. And I'm sure there's no correlation between the stress of a hurricane and working with 50 Southern Baptist churches and rebuilding afterwards. Uh, but that's my role. I'm your local missionary, uh, working with your sister churches in Bay Gulf, uh, part of Franklin County, and a little sliver of Washington County, uh, just for the sake of trying to build a, a movement of believers who see themselves as not just locals, uh, but as missionaries, realizing that this part of the world is just as important as any other part of the world. Because when you look at overseas missionaries, uh, people who lead churches in other places across the country, where do they get that call? They got it from a local environment. And so, like uh, a lot of things in life, the things that are most important are really local. And not to stay local, but to have an impact around the world, but it has to start somewhere, and that's a local environment. So I am so uh, joyful about being a local missionary. And for the team of missionaries that are in our churches, uh, who just follow God's will uh, every day. And nothing, nothing can stop the power of God from pushing back against darkness. Uh, and uh, glad to see Mike Barron's, that y'all keeping him busy. And uh, this trio up here, they're really starting to fly away during I fly away. And uh, it's just a joy to be, uh, to be with you today. Because the Lord's put a story on my heart. He's put a narrative on my heart that I've been working for two years to share through our association. Uh, so yes, 
you're towards the end of that two years who don't take that as something to be offended by. Uh, it's a great compliment. I've been polishing that story for two years. You get the best presentation of what I have to share for you from all the practice that I've had recently. So, let me go to John, the 12th chapter. No pressure that you have food waiting for, for you in the fellowship hall, uh, but I will do my best uh, to be courteous to you while trying to get this, this story out through my heart. In John chapter 12, uh, we have uh, the, the presence of, of a biblical figure uh, that even folks who are not uh, well versed in church uh, have some context of knowing who this fellow is. It's, it's, the, it's the gentleman named Lazarus. And Lazarus has gone near and dear to my heart in the last couple of years, and I'll share with you reasons of why that is in a minute. But I want to turn to a passage about Lazarus that normally isn't thought of and normally isn't studied as much as the most well-known passages about Lazarus. And that's John 12, verses 9 through 11. Then a large crowd of the Jews learned he, meaning Jesus, was there, and the there is Bethany. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. What comes after uh, next is his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, then the week of Passover, then his death, followed by his resurrection. Uh, so they came not, this large crowd came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, the one he had raised from the dead. Therefore the chief priests decided to also kill Lazarus because he was the reason many of the Jews were deserting them and believing in Jesus. May God bless the reading of his most holy and precious word. Now, when I say Lazarus, your thought was probably, okay, we're going to hear from John chapter 11. And chapter 11 is the part where Lazarus was raised uh, from the dead. Uh, there's his sisters, Mary and Martha. They had sent out a plea to Jesus. They had confidence that Jesus could help Lazarus through the illness uh, that he was suffering from uh, that was leading him close to death. And, and so they sent word to Jesus, come and help Lazarus. He's dying. And so they were confident Jesus would get there before he died that he would recover. Well, Jesus didn't get there before Lazarus died. Uh, Jesus, according to Lazarus' family, was four days late. In fact, no, Jesus didn't get started headed in that direction until he had died. And here's the confidence of the disciples around Jesus. Well, well we better go with Jesus because he's about to take a beating. Uh, in fact, they may try to kill him because he didn't show up on time. And so let's go, boys, and take our beating with him. That was their level of expectation of what was going to happen. And when Jesus arrived on the scene, Mary and Martha tried to put on uh, their best face and show senses of sensitivity of, it's okay, we know you didn't make it on time, <clears throat> you're dear to our family, you know, uh, we appreciate that. And Jesus was moved by the grief that the family and friends were going through, even more troubled by a lack of faith they were showing. For Jesus had been spending the last little over three years demonstrating the presence of God that he carried as the Messiah, the Redeemer of the world. And people were willing to let them into their lives as far as that faith would go. But they had boundaries that no one including God could touch. And death was one of those boundaries. And so they had limitations on the power of God uh, based on previous experiences and preconceived circumstances. And that told Jesus they do not believe I'm Messiah enough for them. You know, we have different sizes for God. We say that God is the Almighty. But most of us have some degrees of reservations for certain situations that He can pull us through. Our God's not as big as what He really is. 
There are situations that would challenge our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ if they happen to us. There are situations I dread thinking about more than anything that I pray I don't have to face. But I see through Scripture and through believers around me that I've yet to find the worst situation yet. Because every situation I've seen that seems pretty bad turns out to be a situation uh, that the Lord leads people through, not knowing how in the world they've gotten through. Whether it's grief, whether it's the breakup of a family, whether it's financial crisis, uh, that just because those things happen doesn't mean the Lord can't lead you through. And so I, I believe what I'm sharing this morning has to do with the role of desperation for walking in Christ. I never thought about how desperation could be a good thing in terms of relationship. Desperation sounds like a bad thing. And there are uh, discomforting elements of desperation. It means that you can't solve something by yourself. How many people uh, just hate asking for help? Okay? All right. I hate that. I hate that. I I'm a pretty good giver. I'm not a very good receiver. I made a mistake of telling a lady who went to Bible college with Billy Graham. She was a member of one of my churches, Hazel McCall. And I was in her home for a little Christmas party. And I don't know what got into me, but I had the audacity to say in front of a friend of Billy Graham's that here we are at Christmas time, I just have a difficult time receiving. And she looked at me without blinking an eye and said, well, son, how in the world did you get saved <laughs> if you have a hard time receiving? And that's the last time I mentioned that in her presence. Boy, I mean, she just... It was like Billy Graham himself came along and slapped me down uh, uh, over that and my sign of spiritual immaturity. And so we need to be willing to receive God's blessing. But it is hard. Uh, I had a medical instance I'm about to tell you about. And one of the side effects of that was I couldn't drive for six months. And that was the worst sensation. I'm a lot better person behind the wheel than I am in the passenger seat. <laughs> and asked my wife and um, uh, but, so I had to ask people to take me to places and I cover a fairly large area for it to be a local area and I want you to know I got the largest volunteer Uber army in the world now and some deep relationships have come out of that. I don't know if my marriage could have taken any more time than six months. It wasn't that I said bad things to my wife uh, about her driving. It's just that I grunted at the wrong times, and that told her that told her enough. So you know, the Lord delivered us uh, in in strength of our marriage to get me behind the the wheel. Uh, uh, by the time six months was was up. So we, we hate, you know, asking for help. We hate admitting that we can't do something ourselves. But if you're taking a walk with Christ, you have to be able to give evidence that Christ makes a difference in you. Let me tell you, the people that Christ called to do His ministry were the people He knew could not accomplish by themselves. Moses needed a GPS worse than anybody. Gideon needed a backbone worse than anybody. Peter needed a relationship course, had to work with other people and not be a backbiter worse than anybody. But those are some of the people Jesus used to demonstrate His presence and the power of faith. Because when Moses led people through uh, the Red Sea, uh, people shouldn't have had much confidence that Moses did that on his own. It had to be something, a higher power than Moses. When Gideon uh, led an army and, and God had him reduced to army to it was almost nothing and they defeated a much larger army, you couldn't say that Gideon and his manpower did that. So a higher power had to do that. When Peter represents what the church should be in the amount of faith that they had, even in the midst of denying Jesus, the eve of his death, you have to say that there's something more powerful than just Peter. So don't say that I can't do anything, Lord can't use me. You're probably going to be first in line. Because the Lord doesn't judge us by our resumes. He looks at us based by our submissiveness. Lord, I don't have much, but I give it all to you. Lord, I can't do much, but I'm willing to learn for you. Uh, Lord, here are my skills. It don't seem like it's much. And when you tell the Lord it took 
uh, five loaves and two fishes and fed a multitude. Uh, don't think that, that he can't do a lot with a little. Uh, so I just picture how the people were when they gave up on Jesus. And for the cause of, he had a close friendship with Lazarus. But he had a close relationship with, with his Father in heaven. And he could see where the strength of faith would go and call Lazarus out of that grave. And you talk about a story that lives on today, an event that lives on today. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being Lazarus? It's hard to even imagine people around at the shock they gave up. And here comes Lazarus four days after his death walking out of the tomb. In fact, it's a wonderful song that talks about Jesus was four days late but right on time. It tells us that our timetable put on Jesus is, is not near as accurate as God's timetable. Uh, he knows far better than we do, not just what we need, what the kingdom needs. But have you ever thought about Lazarus? So here's Lazarus, he's dying, and then he dies, and, and, and there's no sense of consciousness there. There's no sense of knowing what's going on. All of a sudden, he kind of slip out. And then all of a sudden, he hears his name and he wakes up. And I could just see Lazarus in that tomb, maybe stinking a little bit, didn't know how he got there. You know, last he saw, he was on his own room. And then he wakes up in kind of a cave situation, and I just hear him now. Holy smokes, no one told me. Who knew? When the word got to him, well, you died, man. But Jesus pulled you out of that. And that's why you're here. I just see him struggling with that cloth around him. I can just see him kind of getting his legs moving again after laying down. I mean, what a shock to his system as well to the people around him. Now, why am I able to share with you in such a precise way what I think that went on with Lazarus? Uh, because on March the 9th, 2021, I woke up and I could tell it wasn't my bedroom. And my wife's standing beside me. And so laying beside me on the bed, she's standing by a bed that has handrails beside it. And I said, where am I? She said, you're in Ascension Sacred Heart Hospital. And so then I started realizing, yeah, this is a hospital room. And I said, how come? She said, when you were taking your walk this morning, your ventricular tachycardia, where your bottom part of the heart races, and I've been treated for that medication and kept in check by medication for about a year because I had an event the year before. And when, when that happened, it raced so hard that your body heart just got to quiver and could not sustain you anymore. And you died in the middle of 17th Street in Linhaven. I said, wow. That must have happened early this morning. She said, honey, that happened six days ago. So what I, had, what I didn't realize was that was the first conversation that I can recollect having with my wife in those six days. She'll tell you that's the 50th time we had that conversation, just the first time I remember anything about it. And what had happened was I was taking my walk. I took about a seven block walk that morning. My wife had been walking with me, but she had to go on to work that day. And I, was, I, I took that walk, and I was apparently on my way back. I still suffer from six days of amnesia, so I'm going off of amateur detective work and what other people tell me as far as the events, how this happened. And I was coming back, and um, somehow I got off my route. So we think I must have been feeling something coming on. Didn't have a lot of abrasions on me, just one bruise on my elbow. So I must have guided myself down to the gravel street uh, and then just laid out. Uh, I was on the wrong street, folks. I'm a meticulous, I'm meticulous about things like this. I know the path I want to walk. I don't want to walk. Yeah, part of it is I want to walk more than I want to walk. <laughs> so, I, so I know exactly how far to go and so I know what streets to take. And so for my seven block walk, my way is, is along, uh, uh, along a street coming back 
uh, I believe it's Vermont, and then I cut over on 18th Street to New Hampshire, not 17th, and then I right close to my house in, in Lynn Haven. And I, I wound up on the wrong street. I, I never walk on 17th Street when I take my walk. I just, I just don't. So to be found on 17th Street is really the wrong street, but this is what God does. He takes our wrong turns, and He does something for God's glory. See, I shouldn't have been there any more than Moses should have been able to part the Red Sea or get in to feed a stronger army or Peter being seen as a linchpin of faith. Uh, however, by being on the wrong street, I was more visible to people who could possibly find me than I would have if I went my own way. Is there a metaphor for our lives there? When we go our own way of the paths that we think out and say, this is the way we've got to go, and we wind up on a different path. Instead of going in panic, God sometimes takes the paths that we wouldn't take and that we don't believe would help us and does something with that to help us. Mm -hmm. The wrong street turned out to be the right street because the people who found me would not have gone the other way. They were going the way I went. And so I was on the wrong street and the wrong people came by. In other words, the people who came by shouldn't have been there at that time of day, at that moment. And because it only takes a few minutes to die when your heart stops, because there's no blood going through your system, there's no oxygen going to your brain, somebody had to, I was walking by myself, and somebody had uh, to have been right there, right after I fell, for all the time elements to click uh, in, in the way that they did. And so people that I know, uh, Ken and Kelly, were going to work, and they usually go separately later. But the night before, Ken had to put his truck in the shop. And so to get to work, he had to ride with his wife, meaning they had to leave earlier. And so they left at the wrong time. That's not the time they should be going to work. But it was the right time for my situation because when they got that four-way stop and looked to the left if traffic was coming, they didn't see a car or a truck or anything other than something in the middle of the road moving his arms and his legs. And they could tell there was a need for help and they went to ten. And they know me, but I was unrecognizable to them that day because I was already having the effects of loss of oxygen and I was looking more like a smurf uh, than I was a human being because of the discoloration of my skin and the agony I was in. They heard breathing, but it was most likely the agonal breathing. The last breaths you take are involuntary impulses of the lung right before you go out from this world. Uh, it's just an involuntary struggle to do something, but the brain is not in command of that anymore. And so the motor uh, movements, my arms, my legs, that was just involuntary movements that was taking place, and they checked for a pulse and they could not find one. The wrong place, uh, the wrong people, the wrong resources. Ken and Kelly didn't have a medical degree, although they had some form of community health background. They knew some basic stuff. But I needed someone a little more advanced than that. Well, I landed in front of a house. Do you know who owned that house? A retired RN. Married to someone who'd worked in a hospice uh, situation. And I didn't know that. But Ken did the person who found me. And he went to get them to come out and help. And as soon uh, as, uh, as that couple uh, 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 came out, uh, as Jody and Nancy came out, uh, first thing Jody did was smack me right in the chest. Not because I owed him any money or anything, but that's what an RN does when there's a cardiac arrest. You need three things, essentially. You need CPR, you need a defibrillator, uh, and you need epinephrine, the shot they give you to stimulate you. And out in the middle of 17th Street in Lynn Haven, where just a few houses are on Gravel Street, they don't keep that and really supply. But the wrong street was the right place for God to have me. The wrong people were the right people for God to send. And a place with no visible resources 
provided the resources that day because Jody and Nancy had the CPR skills. And just about a mile away is the fire department in Lynn Haven. And while Ken was getting Jody and Nancy, uh, Kelly was calling paramedics. And by the time she hung up, and you know, when you're in an emergency, people never get to you fast enough. They may get you to you fast, but you're so needy and desperate for help to come, it just never seems to come fast enough. And I was told it came fast enough that day. Because by the time the phone ended, the paramedic call ended, the paramedics were almost there. And when they got there, three guys got out. So I'm told. First one came. And after Ken had checked for a heartbeat, after Jody had taken the stethoscope and couldn't find one, then this paramedic came and he couldn't find one either. It's three people that couldn't find a heartbeat. Next guy came with scissors. And he cut one of the best long sleeve comfortable shirts I ever owned in my life. I've gotten over that since then. Uh, I don't think I still have it even as, as a memento, but it's no good to me. It just split right there. Maybe I could give it to some of y'all I can make buttons on it or something. I don't know. And I've yet to find one of the nicest jackets I've ever owned since that. Because it's in the 40s that morning, even in, in March. But he did that, so the third guy bring the fib later and shocked me. And then, then the ambulance came in and after. And a place that had that was just miles away from any of this, the resources came to me that day. And it had to work like clockwork. Listen, I understand when people think about coincidences, but I would have to think even the toughest atheist has to be disturbed that so many of these things happened at the same time. Uh, you, I talked to a nurse yesterday, uh, and she asked me what my, my difficulties were. She said, VTAC. She said, you know, that's deadly. I said, yes, ma'am, I know that's deadly. Because I died from it once. And, and you may think I'm over dramatic. I mean, my cardiologist will challenge sometimes. Maybe there was an undetectable heartbeat. But I'm telling you, if I wasn't dead, I was as good as dead. I'm telling you, I was a desperate person on March 3rd, 2021. And I'm still trying to figure out with him what, why am I still here. And I think part of that is it gives me the entree to share this story with you for you to apply to your own sense of, of faith and understanding. Oh, by the way, now I was out in the wrong place with the wrong people with the wrong resources. I had the wrong identity. In other words, uh, my phone was dead when I woke up that morning at home. And so I plugged in the charger. There's no need to take a dead phone to walk with me. And I never take my wallet on a, uh, I, I, up till then. I never took my wallet on even for a short walk. Why do you need your wallet on a short walk? In fact, with the pastors I know, I rarely bring my wallet in church. <laughs> but I did bring money in, in my pocket this morning, James. So I did think of you. But, 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 but I, used to, I just don't take my wallet around that much. That meant nobody knew who it was. So what difference does that make? Well, when you're dealing in a medical situation, particularly a critical one, every bit of a person's history is so valuable and could make the difference between life and death. So my name was Zulu. That's how I showed a police report that we had an unidentified male Zulu found on 17th Street. And, and here's the social media report. It's trying to find my family or someone who knew me. So on social media, they said, identified Zulu found on 17th Street. Uh, they had me 10 years older than what I am. <laughs> that bless your heart. <laughs> they had me four inches shorter than what I am. Now, if you're a man, you understand whether you're short or tall. Every inch is critical in your self-esteem. And they cut me down by four inches. But they had me 15 pound slider, so I was forgiven. <laughs> but no one would have recognized, my own mama wouldn't have recognized me from that description. So how in the world did my family find me? Well, it was also my mother-in-law's birthday who lives with us. And I won't take the time. She also had a miracle in her birth. And that ties into how people found me, or knew, knew who I was. My wife never comes home during the day for lunch or anything else because of her work. But it was my mother-in-law's birthday. 
uh, something like her 85th birthday, and uh, well, actually, it might have been a little more than that, but we'll just give her 85. Oh, wow, happy birthday, Melba. Have been invited to your spanking today, but if people get worn out, let me know, and I'll see what I do to help. But, but it's her birthday, and so my wife and daughter, who had a, a newborn baby, came over to have lunch with her, and they found my truck in the driveway, and at that time of day, for my truck to be there, uh, something had to be off, and I wasn't at home, no one knew where I was, and that's what brought them along thoughts, maybe something happened to him. And then came a police, uh, called a police station, after being passed around a few times, they figured out this lump of humanity we found on 17th Street was about a block away from your house, ma'am. That sounds like that's your husband. And if that's him, he's in Ascension Heart uh, Hospital. And I told her, if I hadn't told her that, that meant either I couldn't, unconscious or something, or dead. And so she made it to the hospital, someone took her there. And I, I was alive. Uh, by the way, I survived this, in case some of y'all are wondering. Um, in fact, somebody was going crazy the other day, said how great I looked. And, you know, I'm overweight and I don't look all that great. But I realized, compared to being dead, I look pretty sharp. Uh, so, uh, so my wife gave what they needed as far as details. And so the story was, for the first 36 hours, they didn't know if I would live. And then the next four days, they didn't know what kind of uh, brain damage I could have suffered. And so even, so but some of y'all in that situation where you survive, it's not the same as thriving. And so there's a lot of uncertainty. If someone's not in the right mind, my right mind's been questioned all my life, but this was a, a literal concern of how things are going to be. And so part of the problem of that six days of amnesia, the last memory I have was getting ready to go and walk, but I don't, my memory doesn't go beyond my bedroom. And so it's blank from that point to the conversation I told you about where my wife told me what happened. And in those six days, there's you know, roughly a day and a half of unconsciousness in and out. And then there was four days of some other personality in this man's body. I was like a dementia patient where I had all my motor skills, but I couldn't separate past and present, and I couldn't separate reality from fantasy. And so the reason I was in the hospital uh, in, those in, in, in those first few days, if you ask me, I'd been lured in by some type of fundraising event and so that's why I came to the hospital to be of help in a, in a fundraising event. And once they got me, they trapped me and kept me for testing. Now I was there against my will. And I tried everything I could to find a way to get out. I, I asked for a phone book, which hardly exists anymore, but I asked for a phone book. And they said, why do you want a phone book? Uh, so I can look up my family doctor's name. I said, well, what's, what's your doctor's name? I don't remember, but I believe I would recognize it if I saw it. My doctor's name, uh, her last name begins with a T, so I would probably still be reading the phone book today uh, looking for the right name. And they said, well, and I said, how, how can I get out of the hospital? I mean, can I get out, you know, if I'm doing okay? And she said, if you're talking about determining that, that you are cognizant, you're in your right mind, you know, our doctor has to do it. So my family doctor couldn't do it, so your family doctor doesn't know what's going on with you. I mean, I try to rationalize out of there. My, uh, I, had a, a, I have a daughter in the Orlando area who stayed with me at nights, and when I, I would have conversations with her all the time, and I'm in a hospital room, nurses coming in and out, and I thought I was in her apartment in Orlando. Now, so to, to not be able to tell that you're in a hospital room, something's not right upstairs. And so I'm so while well, I'm visiting with her, and people are taking blood and my blood pressure and all that, and I said, Kaylin, you have some of the nicest neighbors in, in any place I've ever been. It's just amazing how many of your friends work in the medical profession. You know, I had no, and I, and I saw, you know, the worms and the spiders coming out of the vent at night, the hallucinations. I had the sundowners. Uh, I went. 72 hours without sleep at one point. Uh, and, and so, and that's just a, and I'll go ahead and admit to you, it's amazing I didn't die twice. 
once of cardiac arrest and second by homicide because I called my wife at her own name during that time. <laughs> and the name I called her, which was Vicky, I don't know Vicky in that way. If I did, I'd still lie to you. But I don't. I don't know anyone I've had any kind of relationship with. But I was getting everybody else's name right but my wife's, and so I'm still paying for that one. I've never been to jewelry stores as many times as I've been in the last two years. Let me just tell you that. I'm still kind of paying my way of, of guilt payments. But, but no one, I, I need to, to wind this up. So when you're without oxygen it comes back, it creates an inflammation when it comes back. And that's why I was stir crazy in my head. I was gone long enough, I was dead long enough that uh, oxygen had been gone long enough that my brain needed rebooting. That's really the only cure for that is give it time. And they estimated it would take a week and that's about what it took. It was like a computer needing to reboot and that's what it needed so that when I understood what my wife said and remembered it, then my brain was working its way out and was able to correct some things. Um, and, and glory be to God, uh, my being here betrayed a 5% chance of my living. And I have a lot of people say it was probably less than 5%. That, that 5% is probably generous. Uh, because if you have cardiac arrest in a hospital, you have a 50% chance of surviving that. If you have it away from the hospital, because being away from the hospital means you're not likely to have CPR, the um, fibrillator, the epinephrine, you have a 10% chance. And because living, I mean, surviving isn't the same as living. I mean, if you're a vegetable, then you survive, but you're not thriving in life. So for me to be here speaking to you this morning, there's a less than 5% chance that that should have happened back on March the 3rd. So what, what do you do with that? I think what you do is, as I come to a close, you, you think about, and as I, as, as I try to apply what all this means with the scripture, I think you have to realize uh, that desperation is actually a good model for the Christian life. Here's Lazarus. To me, it's not so much he had a great story. What I told you is a great story. But it's a great story, it's not going to do you any good just because it's a great story. I think what makes Lazarus' story a productive story is what he did with his second chance. And so when you look at chapter 12, you see that the commotion wasn't just about Jesus there in Bethany. The commotion was about Lazarus. They didn't have internet back then. They didn't have newspapers. It was word of mouth. And Bethany is at a higher altitude and two miles away from Jerusalem. But people coming and going through Bethany spread this story that they heard so that there's a bigger crowd a couple months or three months after this event happened, Lazarus was raised from the dead. When we get to chapter 12, it's about three months later, two or three months later, Jesus has been laying low because the whole story has caused the, the Pharisees, Sadducees, Sanhedrin, everybody to start making their plans to, to kill Jesus. And the stir had brought more awareness to Jesus, and more people was coming in faith to Jesus. And that's why at this point, the leadership of the, the temple leadership said, we're going to take Lazarus out too. Because he has, his story and what he's done with it has caused so much influence to bring people to Christ, which hurt their bottom line but raised out of the kingdom. And what Lazarus was doing was he was telling the story, but not leaving it there as just a point of fascination, but he was pointing people to Jesus with it. And it changed his life. It, it made him a more humble per, per person, a more purposeful person, and a person that had total reliance on God. Because there's no doubt for him, with, were it not for God, he would not have this second opportunity. So he didn't gained glory for himself, he passed it on to God. And so, you know, I, I, I want to kind of apply all this to, to, to this. Here's the payout for me. I try to recreate that level of desperation in my prayer. 
And I wish I could say that I do that consistently. Uh, I'm afraid I can only count a series of particular times, but that is progress for me. And what I mean by that is there are needs that strike me as being so important and necessary that I change to schedule my life where I can pray and fast and pour my heart in the intercessory prayer. For I had a church call me one time and they had this huge need that they expected me to have an answer for in 24 hours. And so I changed my schedule to where I didn't have meetings, uh, I didn't have meals scheduled, I prayed and fasted. And my intent was, Jesus, you're going to give me the answer to give to this church. And you know how Jesus spent my time? In his time, he spent on not giving me the answer, but changing me and what I was asking for. So that I showed up with the confidence of a peace that passeth the understanding that Jesus had this. And I didn't have an answer, but I had a sensitivity of, of fellowship with God that I could get the church to ask the right questions and lead them to a solution that came from God to their heart. Far more satisfying than me force feeding an answer to somebody. There's been that way about needs for other people. And when I'm thinking about how desperate I must have been on March 3rd, 2021, and then take that spiritually. If we believe in Jesus, we should be saying, Lord, we are desperate upon you. We're relying on you for every breath that we have. I think revival is missing from this country because believers are not really relying on the Lord. They're saying we do, but we're always coming up some shortcut that we can manage with ourselves. And I think the desperate praying is missing from our churches in our country. I think the humbleness. You know, I'm not come here telling you, look what, what I did, or look at what I earned, because it's just like my faith, my the grace of my life. I hadn't earned any salvation God's given to me. Uh, I have had God's mercy that has kept me from what I deserve. And I've had His grace that's given me what I didn't deserve. But I can do a number of deuce of humility to want to share about this. I don't have the deadlines in my life. People ask you to see the great white light. And I don't have any recollection of that. But my wife said the first thing I talked about, even if my mental stupor, was, did you see Billy Graham as if I had seen him? And if I saw Billy Graham, I must have been close to Great White Throne. I kind of picture Billy Graham and St. Peter operating the pearly gates on a shift system. But, uh, but humility that needs to come in. And then the purposefulness, Lord, why are you keeping me here? And yet I don't think it's any one thing. I think it's just what I'm doing today. I'm sharing with you uh, an intersection in my life where I met Jesus head on. He provided a rescue in my life. I don't know why me. There's so many others that he could have. And that adds to humility. He conducted a rescue. He's not done with me. And perhaps he's not done with me because there's more people to share the story with. Amen. And so I share this testimony. Apologizing that we've delayed your meal time by a few minutes. But I actually did cut some things out of the story. So uh, have, have some mercy. You can blind, bl blame Mike. He gave me two bottles of water today, not just one. But as I come to a close, and as we head towards an invitation, I just want you to think about none of us, the Lord wasn't surprised by March 3rd, but I was. None of us are, can expect what's going to happen next. But we can be prepared. Because we may not have control of what happens next, but we're called to believe in the one who does have control over what happens next. You may have this and not survive and have all glory if you're a believer, but I believe God can take the story whether you make it or not and do something with it for other people. So again, I have no understanding. The Lord promises a peace that passes understanding. No understanding of why me but I do have increased stewardship of what I carry in my life. And I encourage you to that and not to give up on our community or our country because the spark can come from you being desperate spiritually upon God our Lord and Savior. I invite you to that desperation. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, if that was to happen to you, you didn't survive, you'd spend eternity apart from God. You'd spend eternity in hell. 
If you're a believer in that happens, you spend eternity in heaven. It really is two choices. So not out of scaredness, but out of God created you for a purpose when He made you. For His purposes. And I invite you to join in His work by giving your life to Christ today. By just saying, Lord, I don't understand all this Jesus business, but I know that I am undone and apart from You. You made me for a purpose bigger than just breathing the oxygen in this world. And so I give you that point of consideration to work through. Father, thank you for this opportunity to share your good word. As we prepare for an invitation today, I pray that what we prepare for is coming to an understanding where we stand with you, O oh Lord. Just a bit of honesty. And if we have certainty in you, but we have certainty that there's more to do that we have not done, I pray you will unleash in us a fierce determination to carry out the witness to those that we've not shared with. If we're not a believer, I pray we'll carry determination, make that right before the sun goes down today. Uh, Father, just release us to be desperate as if our lives, eternal lives, depend on it, for they do. For the name of Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen. I'm going to invite Brother Sharp.